The old adage goes that he, he walked so others after him could run. So he's been a, a brilliant, brilliant role model for not only myself, but a whole generation. Stedman goes himself. Oh, yes! How oh, nice for the captain in his last game to score his side's first try. My parents came over from the Caribbean, from Jamaica, in 1956, so they're part of the Windrush generation. And I was born in 1958 in uh, West London. Uh, and sadly, before my first birthday, there was a very, very acrimonious split. My father wasn't a nice man. He was a misogynist. He was a bully. He was a wife beater, and sadly, he became a child beater. Uh, and before my first birthday, there was this messy divorce. And while this was going on, me and my older sister, she was 18 months older than me, we were taken into care. I was scared of my father, and no child should be scared of their parents. And I got to the age of 10 and I thought, I can't take this anymore. This isn't right, this isn't fair. And I ran away from home. I didn't plan it. I literally opened the bedroom window, climbed down the drain pipe, ran across the back garden, jumped over the fence, and I took off. And I stayed away from home for nearly three weeks, making it up as I went. I had to find places to sleep. I had to get myself a job to get some food. And I survived on the run as a feral child for nearly three weeks. If you go to any local play park, you'll find some of the slides have got a little wooden structure at the top. And I found a slide with a wooden structure, and that was my alternative lodging. If I couldn't sneak back to my neighbor's shed, I would spend the night slept at the top of a slide in this little hut structure. It was into the third week and I realised it was the end of the school holidays, my friends were going back to school, I wanted to go back to school, but I realised to go to school I'd have to go home and I'd have to confront my father. And I have this image that I just cannot get out of my mind of standing on my father's front door and it was a blue door and I was flanked by a policeman and a social services worker. The policeman knocked on the door my father answers the door, and as he answered the door and he looked down at me, the look of disgust that my own father gave me. And he turned around to the policeman and said, I don't want him back, take him away. And at that point, my whole world just caved in. I felt completely and utterly alone and unsure and not knowing what was going to happen next. So I was then transferred to the children's home, and I spent over seven years there. Most of the time, people think about the negatives and, you know, what was it like and were you abused? Well, in the children's home that I was in, the couple were fantastic and they definitely kept me on the straight and narrow and guided me to do the right things. I can remember um, when I was about 14 years old talking to teachers about doing O-levels and sadly, the response from some of the older teachers was quite negative. I had one member of staff say, your father's a car mechanic, do something with your hands like your father. The best way for me to act was to rise above it, to work hard, to focus and to prove to people I'm intelligent enough, I have the aptitude, I can do what people think I can't do. So my first games lesson at Kingsbury High School would have been on the lower school site where you had about 350 students. We thought we're going to choose between rugby and football. Most of us were going to choose football because North West London is a big football area. Um, but the Welsh P teacher had other ideas and he lined us up on the playing fields on the other side there. And he basically pointed to rugby or football. And when it was my turn, he pointed to rugby and I was desperate to do football. And I pleaded with him to do football. And he refused to budge and said, you're playing rugby, Stedman. And halfway through that first game's lesson, I just fell in love with the game of rugby and loved it. My very first game of rugby was 15 against 15 with this big old brown leather ball when it got wet, it was like a bar of soap. And I was the hooker in the middle of the scrum. Why? Because apparently I had quite broad shoulders and I was one of the smallest boys. I hated it, but I ran around and smashed everything, everything that I could and apparently I did reasonably well there. And then from hooker, I asked if I could move out of the front row because I just didn't like my neck being twisted all over the place. And um, I played in the back row and I played um, flanker. And again, I ran around the park just knocking down whatever I could and really enjoying it. The Welsh coach decided that we needed a very strong tackler at fullback, so he moved me to fullback. And I was the last line of defence. And more often than not, I would pull them down because I love tackling. 
And that worked well, and we were a very successful team, and actually we were county champions. Into my third year fallback, the team got better and better, and began to get recognition within the county as one of the strongest teams. We had a very, very exciting and quick backline. And interestingly, most of the guys in the backline, we were black boys. We loved to run with the ball, but we weren't getting enough of the ball. The coach decided to swap me and the scrum half around. That was the missing link in what became a very, very successful team. The position that I ended up playing, scrum half, black boys didn't play there. They were the wingers, the centres, the powerful forwards, but not the scrum halves. And I would have the opposition doing things and calling me names to try to put me off my game. The black boys can't play scrum half because that's an intellectual decision-making position and they're not good enough. And you'd hear that so many times and I thought, right, I'm going to prove you wrong. When I was in my final year at Borough Road College, um, Harlequins were, were, were asking me to go. In fact, they asked me to go and join a, a tour at the end of the, their season. I sadly couldn't go because it was um, exam time for me. So I had Harlequins knocking on the door. I'd been to Wasps, I'd been captain of their school board team. I'd trained with them the summer before going to Borough Road. So Wasps wanted me to go back to Wasps. And then out of the blue, um, Saracens also approached me because one of my P um, colleges, lecturers, John Hunter, the Ulsterman, he was now coaching at Saracens. And he said, Floyd, I need you to come down to Saracens. But I knew the pressures of being the first black scrum half playing elite rugby. And I had to go to a club that would accept me and not try and push me into another position. So when I came to Saracens, they were, they were a band of brothers. Um, and they did sort of, um, in some ways, sort of, you know, put a finger up against the more established teams. But I liked that. And out of the blue, I was approached and I was asked if I'd be captain. Now, I was only 23 years old, a young black man being asked to be captain of what was a major rugby team. And I just didn't even think, I just said yes. Because for me, it was a huge, huge honour. What I wasn't prepared for was the amount of interest in the media. I knew a man called Tony Bodley, who was a rugby reporter for the Daily Express. He said, Floyd, what you have to remember is that you are the very first black scrum half of a major rugby team. You are the very first black captain of a major rugby team. And a lot of people here don't think you can do it because of the color of your skin. So I captained Saracen for a season and a half from 1982 to 1984. I was then invited to take up the capture again in the 1988-89 season. And at that time, we just missed out on promotion from what was Division 2 into Division 1. Literally, I think it was on goal difference. Uh, we, we two went up and we were third. The number one priority had to be promotion into the top league. We thought that we were good enough. We were playing a really exciting brand of rugby. We knew we weren't going to win much ball, so it was all about whatever ball we get, we go into the open spaces, we run and run and run. And it was a really great, exciting brand of rugby. And all 11 of the Division Two league matches, we won. We won in style, promoted to the top league. We scored the most points. We conceded the least amount of points. Anything that was sort of 10 metres from the line, that was sort of my territory because I, I was quite powerful, you know, and I would sort of run through people, bounce through them, go under their legs, five to ten metres out, and that was sort of my area. Um, but people knew that, but we were smart enough that we had this big inside centre, and me and Lawrence worked well together. So if I wasn't going to get over, Lawrence would get over. So we had a number of ploys where I would be running into challenge with a big inside centre on my shoulder, and it, it worked very well. It was tough, Floyd, um, physically. He was, he was perfect for the role of a scrum half. Strong, physically strong, could pass off both hands. Most of it was running rugby. I mean, that's what we played and uh, he was perfect for it. I said to Tony, I'm going to give you one more season. You know, I think the body can just cope with one more. Um, and we sat down and we set ourselves a priority of just staying in the division. But we went through the season. I don't think we lost a home game. We lost a couple away. We didn't lose a home game. Last game of the season, we were playing Wasps away and we had a mathematical chance of winning the Premiership or the league. Now, we had to score 40, 50 points, which wasn't going to happen. And Wasp beat us, sadly, four tries to one, and they, they deserved to win. And I think if you look at the records, we were third or fourth. I went into that last season knowing that it was going to be my last. I was going to give it my all, and I did give it my all. But I had no regrets. I, you know, I had a wonderful time playing rugby, and I could walk away on a high.
Back when I started playing for Saracens in 1980, we weren't professionals. Now, we were elite sportsmen, but we were not professionals. So we all had to have our day jobs. And for me, I was a young PE teacher. And when I stopped playing rugby, out of the blue, I had a phone call from the High Master of St. Paul's. They said, we want you to be head of sport. Well, what I didn't know was that I was the very first black teacher they ever appointed. I then started to look for headships in the prep sector, knowing full well it was going to be a challenge because there hadn't at that time been a black head in a private school. I would apply for a job, I'd be long listed, I'd be shortlisted, I'll go through two or three days of gruelling interviews and assessments and tests and then to be told, you really did well Floyd, but you just missed out to someone. The person that I just missed out always was younger and was a white middle class male. Were they prepared to appoint a black man as headmaster of their private school? And sadly, at that time, the answer was no. Then a man called Sir Chris Woodhead phoned me and said, I own a company that owns a number of um, independent schools, including Salkin Prep, and I want you to be headmaster of Salkin Prep. I actually tried to look at all that I'd learned as a child, as a runaway, as a child that's been battered by his father, as a young sportsman, as a teacher, put all of those experiences together to be a leader. Because when you're a leader, whether you're a teacher, a head teacher, a rugby leader, you've got to lead in a certain way. And my style of leadership is to really sort of empower people and to give them the confidence to believe that they can do anything. And my job is to try and inspire every child and inspire every teacher within my care. I almost certainly yet met a young Maro Etojo many, many times on this playground. And one day I just went to him and said, Maro, you've got to try this game rugby. You're built for rugby. You could be very, very good. And I'm delighted to say the rest is history. First and foremost, he was a, a brilliant role model for me in terms of the way he carried himself, in terms of how articulate he was, in terms of how he, he led the school and led the teachers, um, his, his standards were exemplary. And I guess he was one of the first people to, to tell me that I should, should play rugby and I should give it a go. So he's definitely had a formative position in, in, in my life. When people talk about an inclusive environment, they've got to be careful because most people, when they talk to me about inclusive environment, I know they're talking about ethnicity and colour. And my response is, if we really talk about true inclusion, we have to go back to the 2010 Equality Act and all of the protected characteristics. So it's not just about race and colour, it's also about religion, it's also about gender and transgender, it's also about sexuality, it's also about physical disability. You've got all of the elements of the protected characteristics. So true inclusion means that you have a, an embracing, open, welcoming environment, whatever people's protected characteristics, and that is very, very important to me.